remember to press the button. It's quite a... So we meet on quite a historic um, moment in history. Once more, we've got, you know, a very important major catastrophic war breaking out on the borders of Europe with Ukraine and Russia. Um, and we have to get our heads around that. I mean, our job is as thinkers, intellectuals, philosophers, not, not politicians. We're not here to sort of um, fight the politics, but we're here to try and heal. I mean, I would just say, I've always loved the statement by Pythagoras, one of my great intellectual heroes. I've come not to teach, but to heal. I think philosophy is the art of healing and that we're trying to see all sides fairly and equally. Um, I mean, I have friends who are Ukrainian. I have friends who are Russian. Feel the energy. Um, you know, I'm, I don't want, I just don't want this war to go on. To me, metaphor that, sorry, somebody's got a funny noise going on. Can you mute? Um, maybe that's Phyllis. Thanks. Um, it seems to me it's like two hands of one body attacking each other. This is a metaphor I've got. Um, when, when I was a young father with two daughters, they would often fight. I would have to split up their fighting. And then, um, <clears throat> it's you know, Ukraine and Russia are like two daughters, two sisters that are now fighting each other. So anyway, I just want to start with that little thought. How can we break up this fight as philosophers and intellectuals? Right, um, Phyllis, could you start just a, a couple of minutes who you are and we'll just quickly introduce everybody and then go to Mandy, our first speaker. Welcome. Oh, yes, I'm uh, Phyllis. I'm in Arizona. Uh, long time connection with Priscilla and Sarah and um, lots of experience behind me and glad to be here. Good. Welcome. Welcome, Phyllis. Um, Priscilla, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. Priscilla Pretzman. I'm in uh, New York, just north of New York City, uh, with Creative Response to Conflict. Nice to see everyone. Welcome. Ian, go for it. Hi. Well, uh, I'm a bit of a historian, a bit of a religious fanatic. Um, uh, so it's hard to put me in a spot. And you're on the board of the World Intellectual Forum. That's Yes. One of the two bodies sponsoring these meetings. We're very much a global um, body, and Ian lives in Melbourne, but is a globe trotter who's travelled all over India. And, you know, so and when you, uh, you'll be speaking after Mandy, you can give us the Australian view on affairs. Ian. Well, it mightn't be an Australian view. It'll be my assessment. <laughs> well, you're you're. I mean, every Australian. Yes. Has <laughs> we know that. Good. Mm. Okay, uh, Sheila, go for it. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, OK, um, I studied astrology from about the age of 30. Uh, to my great surprise, it seemed to work. Um, it started off as my mother saying, oh, he's a cancer and she's a Scorpio. They get on well together. And I thought there's got to be more to it than that. And I found myself working professionally as an astrologer on TV. And I've written a lot of magazine columns. But I also, at the same time as I was doing that, was training to be a therapist, a psychotherapist. So I know a lot about psychology. I've done 10 years training. But um, I had so much fun doing astrology uh, in the media that I almost forgot that I was training <laughs> to be a psychotherapist. So I've got loads to say about the different people that are involved on the world stage at the moment. And I feel that Astrology can be really handy in talking about people uh, and what makes them who they are, because I think it can be quite healing in understanding, ah, that's why they did it. Ah, I get it now. So I'm quite excited yeah. to have a little talk today to everybody. Yeah. Absolutely, Sheila. We're looking forward to it. Sheila will be talking after Ian and sharing some thoughts on the astrology of peace. It's a kind of language that many intellectuals don't use and that's fine but it's a it's a useful language to heal people's uh, differences. Gevork, do introduce yourself. Welcome sir. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I am Gevork Manukian. Uh, I am lawyer and coordinator of a World Intellectual Forum in Armenia. 
Yes, and you've experienced your own conflict recently over Artsakh, and you know we did our best to try and get some discussion there. So, welcome, Gavork. Yeah, Mandy, do introduce yourself. You'll be speaking in a minute, but do a little quick one. I'm Mandy Khan. I'm the writer in residence at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, which is a center for philosophic and spiritual discourse founded in the 1930s by wisdom scholar Manly P. Hall. Great. And I, I, I teach a class on peace and um, most of my work is peace focused. Right, excellent. So Manny will be starting us with a sort of overview of, of the philosophy of peace, which is what we're about here. Okay, Sarah, go for it. Hi, I'm Sarah. I live in Mesa, Arizona. I'm a retired music teacher, and I used to work with Priscilla Pretzman in the Creative Response to Conflict program and have used that in some of my classrooms. And I really believe that music is one of the best bridges between people. It's the universal language. So I'm a singer, and I try to use music as much as possible when I um, work with people. Right, bless you. Well, after my Pythagorean heart, I would agree with you 100%. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. Um, Great. Good. Great to okay. be here. Yeah, welcome. Um, Aaron, let's, let's hear from you. Welcome, sir. Um, hello. Uh, good evening. Good morning. As per your geographic locations, I'm Dr. Arun Pratap Sikarva from the city of Taj Mahal, Agra in India. I'm a university professor and I teach my neurosciences. Happy to be here in the World Intellectual Forum. Thank you. Yes, Aaron will be closing our, our event today with some comments from, um, you know, the neurosciences and uh, the philosophy of mathematics, actually. We have a treat in store that Aaron will be sharing. Barty, go for it. Introduce yourself, welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Bharti from Ajmer, Rajasthan, India. And uh, I am a peace lover, a peacemaker and a wellness consultant now. Earlier, I was into education and IT and I am associated with Ministry of Health Government of India and with Women and Child Development uh, uh, Ministry as an advisor. And yes, uh, I am running an NGO, Uran Bharti Sky Foundation, which is working for youth and women empowerment. And my research program is in Amuka Gym, which is working, which is basically a combination of science, psychology and spirituality, how we can build peace inside us and around us with these technologies. And uh, this research con continues that how sound waves can be used to heal each and every part of body. And yes, I am the international coordinator with World Intellectual Forum Youth Wing as well. So we all are here for the same uh, goal. So welcome all of you on the board. Right, greetings, namaste, hello. Um, Phyllis, do introduce yourself. Sorry, Rosalba, we, we heard from Phyllis, not Rosalba. Yes. Thank hello. you. You can hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. I am Rosalba Natero. I am the president of Eco Spirituality Foundation based in North Italy. Uh, Eco Spirituality Foundation um, is a, a, a way to spreading a philosophy that uh, in the thought of his founder, Giancarlo Barbadoro, he, he thought that is a, a key to resolve all problems of the world. <laughs> um, is a, is a way to resolve many problems for the world. Uh, Eco-spirituality is a, a connection of nature, an harmony, an inner harmony that it, it could be a standard of all uh, the planet, of all, uh, all the people. So uh, it, right. it's my work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, well, I'm sure there'll be time to hear more detail, Rosalba. Okay. I think you have a statement to read out and so, You'll have your speaking slot a bit. Yes, later. yes, I've, 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 I read so the People from Italy, America, India, Armenia, <laughs> Australia. We're doing quite well, I think. Um, Shreya, do introduce yourself, please. 
Hi, uh, I'm Shreya. I'm from India. I'm a law student and also a student of psychology. Um, I was also very graciously introduced to restorative work by uh, Priscilla here uh, as a part of the CRC initiative. And I got to meet uh, Thomas through that. Um, I'm very lucky for those connections. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing space uh, with all of you today and, and learning so much. Thank you. Right, nice to see you again, Shreya. Hello. Thanks. Okay, so look, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> And this, if this was a normal class, I'd bang my Tibetan gong now. We do a couple of minutes meditation, but just imagine that's happened, okay? Um, <laughs> let's invite Mandy as our first speaker to, to explain to us the philosophy of peace um, in her own words. She's a very innovative thinker who's been teaching a peace class in Los Angeles and um, an amazing thinker. So um, it'd be nice to hear from that as our first opening slot and then from Ian. So Mandy, go for it, it's all yours. Welcome. Hi, can everyone hear me all right? Beautiful, I'm so incredibly grateful and honored to be here. So I teach a peace class at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm gonna just cover, touch on a few of our, the tenants that we uh, focus on in this class. The first one is there is always a pathway to peace, but one must be in the peace mind to perceive it. <clears throat> so what is the peace mind? The peace mind is a free resource that everyone has within their own consciousness, within their own physiology. So imagine your consciousness as a 20 story building and imagine a spiral staircase extends from the very top of that 20 story building all the way to the very bottom of that 20 story building. If your consciousness is 20 stories high, your peace mind is the top story of your consciousness. So it's the very highest aspect of your consciousness. So Imagine yourself, your own perspective as a figure that all day or all week moves up and down that staircase within your own consciousness. Some people uh, tend to stay within a few floors. Some people over the course of a day or a week sort of roam freely up and down their own consciousness from um, level of perspective to level of perspective. Some people spend quite a lot of time up in that top floor, their peace mind. Others don't necessarily access that part of their consciousness very frequently. So we all have an aspect of our consciousness where we, we feel most comfortable or we like to hang out. What's important to understand is that everyone has a peace mind, it's free, it's an inherent part of our physiology. And if we choose to engage it, we can have the, the ability to perceive the pathway that exists to peace from wherever we are. So the beauty of the peace mind is that once we go there, we can always effortlessly see the pathway to peace, the pathway to harmony um, from the peace mind. It is natural for us to honor all beings. When we are located in the peace mind, it is natural, it is inherent, it is effortless for us to honor the earth. It is effortless for us to honor the waters of the earth. We remember when we are in the peace mind that the waters of the earth are holy. Um, it is effortless to be kind to others. In fact, when we are in the peace mind, when we look around at others, what we see is what is lovable about them. When we are in the peace mind, we do not effort to love. We do not effort to honor others. We do not effort to honor the self or to love the self. We do not effort to forgive the self or to forgive others. So it's this place of the effortlessness of the experience of the full body of peace. Well, the beauty of the peace mind is that when we are there, it is clear. 
which step we take first that will take us from where we are to a state of peace and not just a state of end of conflict, but a state of perpetual peace. Perpetual peace is always available from where we are. It's simply that when we are not in the peace mind, um, that pathway is to some degrees invisible. Sometimes it can feel very difficult to get to peace from where we are. Sometimes it can feel impossible to get to peace where we are, from where we are. Well, it's never impossible. Um, it can just feel difficult and that path can be um, impossible to perceive from where we are. So the reason that we work with the peace mind in peace class is that there are pretty simple techniques that we can practice that can make it easy for us when we choose to move um, effortlessly up and down that staircase within us. Once we understand that the peace mind is a place of effortless peace within us, that it's free, that it's inherent to each of us, and that all that we need to perceive our path to peace is simply to be there, then we can simply learn a few techniques um, that will help us to just get that practice so that it is ingrained. Um, I loved that earlier um, we were talking a little bit about, Sarah was talking a little bit about music. Um, probably everyone here has a pathway to peace, has a method of building um, their own movement between where they are up into their peace mind that is their most comfortable um, and most used technique to get there. Uh, I, I teach this weekly peace class. We meet every Wednesday and every week I teach a new technique uh, that we can use to get to the peace mind um, so that people essentially have at their fingertips, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 of these techniques to choose from so that um, they can really step into a place of power in regards to their own placement within their own consciousness, understanding that this free resource is available to them. So here's something else that we focus on in peace class. So the absolute value of the following two statements is the same. Statement one, I do not want war. And statement two, I want to go to war. So the absolute value of those statements in terms of what they create in the world is war because we create what we focus on. So we have the opportunity to understand that when we create, we create by way of absolute value. Meaning if we are focused on what we do not want and how passionate we are about what we do not want, that focus on what we do not want builds more of what we do not want. However, once we understand that, we can step into our own position of power in regards to our own creation. And we can simply flip the focus to what we do want and why we want it. So that's something that we really focus on in peace class. We focus on um, how to work with the power of our own creative ability, how to honor the fact that we create with our focus, how to understand how, how our consciousness works and how we are creating all the time. Once we understand these laws, those of us who love peace have the opportunity to step into a very active role in regards to what we are building. So we can use our love of peace in these times to build peace. That's a huge opportunity that's available always, but it is especially available now. So in times of big conflict, world conflict, we have the opportunity because it's really central in our focus to, if we choose, to choose 
a really active relationship with how we build our world. So the way that we can engage our love of peace to build peace is by getting into the aspects of a peaceful society and lingering on what we love about those things. So what is a peaceful society like? A peaceful society is a place in which all beings are honored. A peaceful society is a place in which the land is honored, the forests of the work of the world are honored, the waters of the world are honored. It is a place in which there is natural harmony between people. It is a place in which it is effortless to see what is lovable about others and lovable about the self. So when we, it is a place of flowing community. It's a place in which it is natural to support others. It is a place in which we have such a sense of oneness among us that when we are kind to others, it comes from a place of, of that includes a love of the self. We no longer feel like we have to choose between kindness to self and kindness to others. We understand that the connection between beings is so complete, so inherent and so complete we remember that kindness to others is kindness to self and kindness to self is kindness to others. So when we focus on the aspects of a peaceful society and we focus on what we like about each of those aspects, when we linger in the feeling of what it feels like to be treated with kindness, what it feels like to teach to treat the self with kindness, what it feels like to be in a community that is caring towards us, what it feels like to have the opportunity to extend kindness and caring to others. When we get into those feelings, and, and in my peace class, we use journaling practices. So every week we'll come together um, and there will be a different opportunity to journal out. And in that journaling, we're really getting into these feelings because that's essentially how we create. So we use our own, our own sense memory, really, uh, records of, sometimes um, we'll use a technique where, where we will simply say, when was the last time I truly felt at peace? Where was I? What was the place like? What did, it, what did it look like? What did it feel like to be there? And then we'll go into a journaling practice and we'll journal out going more deeply and more deeply into our own sense memory. Then we have a record of what it feels like to be in full peace. And that record is a tool that we can, that we can return to. So we can use our love of peace we can use our own feeling of peace to build more peace, but we cannot build peace, perpetual peace with our desire to, with our dislike of, of conflict. Our dislike of conflict cannot build perpetual peace. It's, it's, it's an unfortunate, it's an unfortunate fact because there is so much focus on our um, dislike of conflict. But once we realize that we can create a world in which conflict doesn't begin, that's, that's what a world of perpetual peace is. We come together to build a world in which conflict does not begin. So when we create a world in which conflict does not begin, we do not have to focus on ending conflict because a world of perpetual peace no longer has conflict um, breaking out as it does now. So the situation that we are in now, um, I call it the, the era of belligerence, is one in which there's a focus on tamping down the um, outbreaks of belligerence that occur. And that tamping down, um, creates a situation where violence pops up somewhere else. As long as there is that which is unloved in our collective consciousness, it will pop up in these ways, in actions that are unloving. So 
in peace class, we focus on our collective consciousness and we focus on ways in which to heal it, to heal the self and to heal the collective consciousness so that we create that state of perpetual peace. So just to touch briefly on the concept of how this works. So the collective consciousness is like a lake of consciousness and each person's individual consciousness is like a tributary river or stream that flows into the lake of collective consciousness. All day, every day, the stream of you, the stream of your own consciousness flows into that lake of collective consciousness. So all day, every day, we have an opportunity to decide what we choose to put into the stream of ourselves, which flows directly into that lake of collective consciousness. So all day, every day, we are gifting that which is us to the collective consciousness. So the reason that I love working with the substance of peace, working with peace itself, is that when peace enters that lake of the collective consciousness, it is an agent of healing. So the, there, I work with a number of definitions of peace, but one definition of peace, and, and that's because peace is so multifaceted, but one definition of peace that we work with is that peace is the embodiment of these words. Um, so imagine two, two people coming together in conflict. Peace is the embodiment of the words, you are deserving of unconditional love and unconditional honoring at all times. And I am here to love you unconditionally now. So from peace's perspective, peace is able to see from that higher perspective, and we enjoy this when we go to the peace mind, that every being is worthy of unconditional love and unconditional honoring. All that is not peaceful, all that is resentment and anger, it is a record of a person having experienced that which was not love. Um, it, is a, it is a record of someone feeling unloved by others, by themselves, by society. So when we work with peace, which sees that which has not been loved, which recognizes the holiness of all beings and the inherent worthiness of all beings to be loved completely. When we are working with the substance of peace, we are working with the most healing substance that exists on the planet. And when we choose to engage with peace in our individual experience to flow that substance of peace by way of the tributary stream that is us into the collective consciousness, that peace, as it enters the lake of consciousness, it heals. It heals by encountering all of those bits of that which has not been loved. And again, saying, you are deserving of unconditional love and unconditional honoring at all times, you have not been loved and you have not been honored. And I am here to do that now. And in that encounter, there is a healing. There's a true healing into, into wholeness. So when we choose to work consciously with the healing power of peace, we are doing, uh, we're, we have the opportunity to do a, a permanent work of healing. So anyway, that's something that we come together to do uh, every Wednesday night in my peace class to engage that, to engage the healing powers of peace. So both to share that, to share the substance of peace in the collective consciousness, but also to do personal healing work. Um, we'll, we'll often work with our own heart's energy to ask the question, what, what is there within me that is calling for love now? What can be further healed within me? So we both work with personal healing practices so that we can hold as much peace as possible. 
And then we set the intention to hold that peace and to send that healing agent of peace into the collective consciousness. What happens when a little bit more peace flows into the collective consciousness is that the collective consciousness begins to heal. It is possible then for the collective consciousness to hold more love. And when there's more love in the collective consciousness, when there's more peace in the collective consciousness, there is a natural lifting of perspective. It becomes easier for more people to access their peace mind. And people spontaneously begin popping into their peace mind, looking around and seeing what is lovable and worthy of honoring in other people. That's when we begin to enter a state of perpetual peace. When more people are living naturally from the place in their own consciousness that is their peace mind, and they're gazing around at others, they will see what is inherently lovable about others. They will not effort to um, tolerate others. That's a lower expression of being to effort to tolerate others um, comes from you know when you are efforting to tolerate others that you are somewhere else in your consciousness than your peace mind. Because when you are in your peace mind, there is never, um, there is no difficulty in loving others. You remember that it is inherent in you to love others and your, and that includes yourself. So, It is possible for us to be aware of what is going on in the world and to still use the majority of our focus to build a peaceful world. So these are, at times like these, when there is great conflict, when there is great belligerence and, and this incredible outbreak of belligerence, we have the opportunity to engage active peace building skills and we can still be aware of what's going on in the world. And how we do this is by being aware of the percentages of our focus that we are giving to that which exists and that which we want to build. So, um, we can, I, I like to use, I like to work with anywhere from uh, 5% and 95% and, or maybe 10% at a time like now, maybe 10% and 90%. Meaning if I am spending a certain amount of time focusing on what is going on in terms of conflict that is breaking out right now, then I simply note that and note, okay, I'd like to spend 10 times as much time today or this week, focusing on what I love about harmony between people, focusing on how lovable I remember that everyone is, focusing on how exciting it feels to me when I see a community existing in harmony, focusing on what it feels like to walk through a community where people are treating each other with love and respect. So, I am able to both engage an understanding of what's happening now, to be awake, to be aware, to be present to this time in history, but also to actively engage my own focus for in the act of building a world that I would like to step into. So, the mind of dichotomy wants to believe that we have to choose either, you know, we have to be completely focused on what is happening now. Well, what happens then is that we essentially give, give our power away. We give the, uh, the power of our focus away to that which is, and we inadvertently build more of what is. But when we step into our place of power, understanding how it is that this situation came to be, how it was built, and how we can use the incredible resource of our own focus 
to build what we'd like to experience, well, we step into a power to both build the world that we'd like to experience and to build it perpetually, essentially to heal, to, to heal us completely out of the era of belligerence. We cannot, we cannot end the era of belligerence by simply continuing to um, tamp down violence wherever it erupts. That will, when we tamp down violence in that way without a process of healing occurring. So, so I talked a little bit about um, how peace is, is basically, a, it is a, it is pure healing, essentially. It is an acknowledgement that all are deserving of unconditional love and unconditional honoring. So there is an opportunity for healing ceasefires um, that can end conflict. So when there is an, a conflict that is occurring, there is always the opportunity that two parties would come together and could essentially have that, that act of miraculous and permanent healing occur in their dialogue. And both could choose peace in that moment and could choose to honor the other with unconditional love in that moment. And we can have a healing ceasefire. That is possible. Um, and were there to be an incredible outbreak of healing ceasefires, the kind of ceasefire that um, not just ends one conflict, but heals all that has not been loved between us, that is possible. But tamping down the outbreak of violence cannot permanently end violence. It simply, um, it, it simply relocates violence somewhere else because if it's, if there is that which has not been loved and honored in the collective consciousness, it does pop up as violence um, somewhere. At the same time, we have this incredible opportunity to simply heal all of that which has not been loved and to end this, end this cycle for good. So I just wanted to touch on the example of what went on in the Haight-Ashbury district in the 1960s in regards to the end of the war um, with Vietnam as a way in which I believe these percentages that I mentioned were, um, were very well used. So the activists that came together in the Haight-Ashbury district in the 1960s um, here in the States were, they came together because they were ready to end the war in Vietnam. And they came together in, in a spirit of always acknowledging that they were there to, to end that conflict, but they spent most of their attention um, in a celebration of the peace that they wanted to experience. So that coming together in the Haight-Ashbury was really an experiment in community. Um, there was an incredible amount of uh, people helping each other, helping strangers, sharing food, being together, um, dance, celebration, joyousness, music never forgetting that they were there for the very specific reason of ending this war, ending this conflict, but never giving um, all of their focus on, the, on, on um, conflict, instead using their very real desire to end that conflict as an opportunity to build a peaceful, and communal experience so that people could sort of walk around the hate and be given food and be given community and be given support. So they exampled um, a, a very different energy. And um, so I just, I, I just wanted to bring that, bring that up as an example of how we can presence kindness and community 
um, as, as a way of, of literally building the opposite energy uh, in the field from, uh, from the conflict that we'd like to see ended. And I just wanna mention that um, there's a big difference between ignoring the problem and intentionally working with the energy of harmony to build peace. So we have the opportunity to intentionally work with the energy of harmony. And when we do that, we create a situation of harmony. We, we by, by, by building harmony, by focusing on our love of harmony, by building loving community and focusing on our love of, of loving community, we are able to intentionally work with those energies. It's not the same as ignoring the problem. This is why I like to work with these, um, these percentages and because we can both be aware and be working actively with harmony to build that which is harmonic. Right. <clears throat> okay, well, look, Mandy, I, I'm gonna say thank you very much for that. We could listen to you all day. I'm sure we could listen for another couple of hours, but if you want to take an even deeper dive into Mandy's work, then go to her peace class, which she's teaching once a week. Um, you've raised so many important issues. Um, we could spend the rest of the entire session discussing them. Just a couple of comments. Um, <clears throat> I gave a lecture yesterday to an Indian university about Buddhist, um, the paradox of desire. You know, the very desire for peace, in a sense, creates the opposite. And you touched on that. It's a very subtle thing. If we can transcend that I want, which comes from ego, then, then, it, then it starts snowing. We all know this. The, you know, if you, when you're a child and you want it to snow, you want it to snow. And when you give it up, <clears throat> then it starts snowing. I think that's the phenomenon that Mandy's talking about. But it's very difficult. I just had a conversation with our philosopher in Ukraine, who's in Kiev, or Kiev, as I have to say, <clears throat> and who probably isn't going to be able to join us because she, <clears throat> you know, they're living like a, a, a nightmare situation. And um, maybe she will join us, <clears throat> or maybe not. Um, and there, you know, there are, there's a mass of tanks outside their city, um, 14 miles away. So for us to tell her, <clears throat> look, stop wanting peace, you know, maybe we need to think about a way of reframing it because, um, but anyway, that's just, a, that's a huge topic. We, we, it's a shame she's not here to put that question to you. Um, but anyway, I want to thank you very much. And at the end, hopefully, those of us that can stay for more discussion, we can, we can, you know, pick uh, Mandy's brain because it's a very uh, powerful peace mind, as you say. Thank you so much. Um, right. Can we move on to um, <clears throat> our dear friend Ian, who is, who is at the other end of the time scale? He's at two thirty in the morning in Melbourne, and he's a wise old interfaith uh, leader who's done work with spirituality, consciousness, and peacemaking for many years. Um, I've met him in India. He's on the board of the World Intellectual Forum. So Ian, over to you. What is your take on the Ukraine war? How can we solve it? Um, and what do you think Mandy has given us in the way of clues? Um, uh, we mm -hmm. look forward to hearing your views on this. Thank you, Thomas. Well, uh, let me start with a, uh, an acknowledgement that we are in an Indian uh, environment. There are so many Indian friends around us tonight. There always are. But uh, you know, I'm particularly th thoughtful of the fact that for two weeks in March, April, I shall be hosting two uh, colleagues, close friends from Nagaland with me here in Melbourne. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And I've just been planning a, a very complex, but I hope interesting two weeks stay, stay for them. Um, now, turning to Mandy's uh, address to us, uh, I, I quite agree that uh, a ph philosophical rethink has got to be behind every approach to stopping war 
and generating peace. But one cannot be philosophical in isolation from history. And um, a brief overview of the history of what we now call the uh, the crisis, the uh, Ukraine-Russian crisis, um, is necessary before we can really come to grips with a way forward. Uh, I think you're all probably aware that in 1990, as a part of the negotiations to bring down the Soviet Union, apart from enormous economic pressure, which was brought to bear by the Western powers, there was enormous political pressure as well. And uh, it included the establishment of or the, the acceptance of a founding act on mutual relations, cooperation and security between NATO and the Russian Federation. And it was signed in Paris uh, uh, as a prelude to what we call the economic collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it included specifically uh, the undertaking that the US and its NATO allies would not make any attempt to establish uh, a frontier closer to the Russian border than existed at the end of World War II. And that Russia agreed that it would relinquish all interest in Germany, politically, that is, um, uh, in return for an undertaking that NATO would not move any further towards the Russian border. That has been progressively undermined, deliberately over, uh, overlooked. In fact, a, a couple of American political leaders are on the record of saying almost before the ink was dry, well, now let's, count, let's get down to the job of edging up on Russia. And it's been the same ever since with a series of changes uh, which have been made. Uh, I've got the complete document here, two or three of them. Um, the history of the, the conflict and so on. Um, and the times at which uh, they were modified and the reasons for the modification. Um, and uh, they're far too complex to go into any thought of now. But it bring, that brings me back to Mandy's point that um, we cannot generate a peace environment without um, accepting relationships and honesty as a basis of uh, uh, recognition of everyone's needs and aspirations and without any sense of pursuing domination or hegemony. Um, and uh, it's interesting to follow the pattern of rejection of those things bit by bit. Um, the uh, first significant changes were made in 1997 when the Lisbon Agreement uh, formally uh, uh, recognizing the, the establishment of the European Union uh, came into being. And that required some recognition of this prior agreement between the NATO powers, which, one, which did not cover all of Europe and uh, Russia. And uh, uh, they made no attempt to conceal uh, America's intention that NATO should continue to go east. In fact, um, that was written into the, uh, the Lisbon Accord. Uh, let me just look for the words, but it was words, oh, I can't now, I've got too much paper in front of me. It was words to the effect of, um, without regard to what we have just signed, we will continue to press to uh, have the countries of Central Europe join NATO. 
and that meant taking NATO border closer and closer to Russia. And that included especially gaining domination of Ukraine, which was critical because it was the separating the area between the two blocks and having been an integral part of the Soviet Union up to that time. Um, so uh, each time, or, and in particular, uh, one of the other things was that um, NATO would not take any steps to introduce nuclear weapons into countries which may accept invitations to join NATO and would not stockpile them or, or permit them to be stockpiled in any NATO aligned countries. Now, as you all know now, that is a load of crap. Um, and uh, to say that um, uh, Putin is simply trying to uh, regain control of Ukraine when he accepted all of the agreements which had been made all of these years and has done nothing except uh, try to negotiate every time there's been a slight adjustment to the agreement to uh, return to that initial agreement that there would be uh, no pressure on countries to join NATO and no stockpiling of munitions aimed at Russia. Um, and I'm sure uh, it would take me too long to turn the sheets of paper to give us a, a time by a time scale of what's gone on. But um, uh, what I a question, just to clarify, because um, <clears throat> what you said is very important historically. I'm a historian too, and I, I noted in 1990 when I went to Moscow, the Treaty of Paris was signed. We all thought it was the end of the Cold War. We got very excited. Mm. America and mm -hmm. Russia and Europe could now live in peace and everyone would live happily ever after. We'd have what was called the peace dividend, right? And, but if I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> this agreement that East European countries wouldn't join NATO <clears throat> was never written into the agreement in writing. It, it, it was written. Agreement, a verbal agreement only. And Russia- No, no, no. It, that, it is in the documents, Thomas. Well. Okay, I've read a different source that says it wasn't in the documents, and I have got a text on the Treaty of Paris. So the way yes. we turn now, but in the next couple of days, can you send me the actual? Oh no, Paris. I'm too busy. I don't want to do that, Thomas. I've got well, far okay. too much on the plate. But what I can say is that the document you need to look at is the, the Treaty of Lisbon, not. The, uh, the Treaty of Paris. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's agree, let's agree, Ian, that that statement that no East European country will join NATO is not in the Treaty of Paris. It not is that they are, you agree. Not that they would not, because the Americans made it clear they would, they they would a, continue to uh, encourage them to. Well, yeah, the, the, West, the West then broke that verbal agreement. And that's yeah. why Putin's so angry, and so is Gorbachev. Yes. And question: yes. You know, Diplomats say, "Oh well, we didn't write it down." No, nah, no, nah, you know, we won. And I think I think we should be ashamed. You're right of NATO and the Wests and America saying, "Oh, we didn't write it down, so we can do what we want." You know, that's not how civilized states behave, is it? And you're absolutely right to point that out. That's right. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, I, I come back to the point, have a look at the Treaty of Lisbon, which is yep. the one in which they made those statements. Um, now, uh, it, we've got to note, too, that not all of the NATO countries are at all comfortable with backing the uh, Ukraine resistance. And uh, when even the media now is being forced to say the Western world, acknowledging that two thirds of the world is not supporting the re Ukraine position. And that includes India, the countries of the Middle East and Africa. Uh, on block, they are staying out and uh, there was no unanimity, uh, nothing near it uh, in any of the votes that have been taken on the matter. 
Um, and But in Australia, all we get is a pummeling from the American dominated uh, media, which continues to tell us every day how dreadful Putin is and uh, how shocking these attacks on, on the Ukraine civil population is. And of course, we know well enough from the history of the Middle East wars, uh, Bosnia and everything since then, that uh, weapons go astray. And as, as much as you might like to aim only a few key military targets, put pressure on a government to make peace and accept the change of government because they're simply trying to get rid of the current president. Because if he goes, then the relationships change and come back to a more even keel. Yeah. And I think he's the one who, uh, he's not included in the peace negotiations, which are now about to take place on the border with, with uh, uh, um, Belarus, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, he's deliberately excluded from those uh, conversations. And if he had stood down uh, four days ago, then the bombing would not have even started. It's as simple as that. Um, okay, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, anyway, back, let, me just, let, me, uh, let me just move on because we have some other speakers. Yes, and, um, I'm aware of that. I understand I, I, your uh, views well known. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much because it's it's good to hear an alternative to the, you know, the kind of mainstream media. Um, and you've studied these matters for a long time, so I appreciate that. And Ian, I should say, is also an expert in China, which is a whole other area. We, we you know, the role of China in this is, is crucial. It is also being neutral. India is neutral. It is actually sending supplies and help to Ukraine of a humanitarian nature. So India is trying to play yeah. both ways. They're helping because there's a humanitarian disaster. Whatever you want to say, justifying, you know, Russia's feeling angry with the West, it doesn't necessarily morally follow that it's justified to send in tanks and armies to invade an independent country, you know. Uh, we have to sort of separate out some of these issues and as philosophers, oh, yes, yes. analyze them separately. You know, two wrongs don't make a right is, is the old, that's what I was taught as a kid, you know. Yes. Look, um, and, thank you, Ian. I, I, you know, love you and greet you and I send you out. Okay. <laughs> well, I shall sit here for a little while longer okay. to see what people are saying and yeah, get yeah. any well, reaction. Thank you. Thank you it's uh, three uh, o'clock. Then quietly withdraw, you'll, you'll sure. know that I've gone off to bed. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, I want to move on to our dear friend Sheila, because she's going to bring in a totally different approach, which is, you know, the study of the stars, astrology. Now, as philosophers, um, philosophers are, are split on this issue, just as much as we're split on Ukraine, Russia. We're split on astrology. Half of us think you know, it's it's stupid, old, superstitious nonsense. But there were some very profound and deep philosophers that thought it's actually very wise. And I just want to introduce um, uh, the fact that Maimonides, the greatest Jewish philosopher and Aristotelian, I'm quoting from a history of astrology, said he'd read every single Arabic book on the subject. Maimonides wrote in Arabic and Hebrew. And he believed the stars were living animated beings and that they were as many pure intelligences as, as there were spheres, spheres. And he, you know, so he absolutely believed in astrology. And in the West, the greatest intellectual of the time was a man called Albertus Magnus, who lived from 1193 to 1280. He was the teacher of Thomas Aquinas. And he absolutely accepted astrology. And in his writing, he said, the heavens and the stars are instruments of the first mover or prime intelligence. And they're the mediums between the first cause and matter. So I just, I'm just going to invoke Albertus Magnus and Maimonides to support Sheila 
um, <laughs> who's going to give us an overview of this crisis from an astrological perspective. And how can we use astrology to heal this conflict? Going back to Mandy's point, we, we're healers here. Yeah. Go for it, Hi. Okay. Hi, everyone. I was so pleased to hear Mandy and Ian speak in the way that they did, because I've been thinking very much along those lines myself. And I've started to think, you know, if I was doing Putin's horoscope, or particularly Joe Biden's, actually, how would I go about saying, actually, guys, you know, we need to think about some things with regards to both of you. So when Thomas asked me to speak for a while, he asked me to speak about Putin, naturally, Biden, Macron and uh, Boris Johnson. But I wanted to add Trudeau if I had time. Um, and I just want to explain quickly what astrologers see up in the heavens and how that is affecting the world. Because I think if I put it in context, first of all, everybody will get the hang of this. So the first thing is that Neptune and Jupiter are both aligned in Pisces at the moment. Uh, and Pisces is the sign of spirituality and goodness and the higher good and all the rest of it. But it's also, uh, it can get you into some trouble because the negative side, because it's always positive and negative, negative side is we could all get drunk or end up in a drug den. And I have to say that for a lot of us, myself included, we do feel like we're in a bit of a alternative universe at the moment. <clears throat> we don't really know what to think about anything, everything that we read, what can we believe? Is that really the case? And it's very confusing. And I've got quite an amusing story, if I can dare to be amusing, when I consider how absolutely awful things are in Ukraine at the moment. So I'm not making light of that, but I did find out something that made me smile this afternoon with regards to the confusion that's going on in the heavens with Neptune and Jupiter in Pisces. And as an astrologer, I knew that in February, March and April of this year, something massive was going to happen. And it probably wasn't going to be very good. But it doesn't mean to say it's the end of the world. But it means that people are thinking about what is the moral good thing to do. But also, everybody's confused. And so when they hear in the media that Putin is a devil, well, he's certainly done some terrible things this week, but is he? And so that's what I want to talk about. And the things that Ian was talking about, I just, if anybody's got a pen and paper, just write down another Vladimir, Posner, P-O-Z-N-E-R, because if you look at him on YouTube, he has got the most fantastic talk which he gave, he delivered this talk at Yale University three years ago. And, he, and the title of his talk is How the United States Created Vladimir Putin. And if you listen to that, you will understand Vladimir. And you will understand how this has come about because he has been ignored, downtrodden and treated with contempt for a long, long time. And at one time he wanted to join NATO and he asked if maybe we could get together with Europe and it was poo-pooed. Now that doesn't give him carte blanche to behave the way that he has, but there's a lot of things that are happening under the surface, very Neptune, uh, Jupiter. Um, for example, Biden has a lot of business and I've I'm putting inverted commas around this. He's got a lot of business interests in the Ukraine, of all places. Now, why, why would a man, an American man with lots and lots of money, want to go to Ukraine such a lot? We have to ask ourselves this question. There's something going on under the surface that we don't know about. And we need to be aware of that. Because the one thing that struck me and what Mandy said is we have to see the lovableness in others. And actually, I think that looking at Putin's chart, he thinks he's on a bit of a mission at the moment. He thinks that he's on a clean-up operation, 
and he wants to get rid of corruption. Now, he's not going about it in quite the right way, but maybe it's through sheer frustration that he's doing this. Um, I'd be very pleased to hear what other people say about this after. So I don't want to spend too long because I've got so much to say. But another thing that's going on in the heavens is that Pluto has been slowly moving through Capricorn and uh, it's about the downfall of governments. And they are going to fall and they are going to fall big time by 2024. And we've already seen the signs of it. There's so much unrest. Australia, right across Europe, Canada, politicians are behaving bizarrely. All their human weakness is coming to the fore. And the only way to deal with this peacefully is to say they are human beings and we need to understand these people to understand why they're behaving in the way they are. So I think that's why Thomas asked me to speak because I'm a psychologist as well as an astrologer. So I'm very interested in all of this. So can I start with Joe Biden? Only because it's easier to see what motivates him. So the first thing I'd say if I met Joe Biden as an astrologer is I'd say to him, Joe, the question I want to ask you is, how do you see yourself? But I know I can't ask you that question because you don't know how you see yourself. So Joe Biden is so complicated and he's the ideal person to be the president at the moment because he'll just do whatever he's told. He will just, he, he doesn't know his own mind and he never has. He opens his mouth and he doesn't really think before he speaks. So at the moment, all he has to do is read something that's put in front of him. He's a kind of figurehead and he's very, very interested in money. He's got Pluto and Jupiter in the eighth house. Oh my goodness, he's greedy for money. It's his, his reason for living. And he's also got Uranus and Saturn opposite the ascendant, which is very tricky because he wants to be seen as somebody who's very steady and you know he knows what he's doing. But he just suddenly, he'll decide, no, 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 we don't want to do that. We want to do the other thing. And I would say to Joe Biden, because I'm thinking about what Mandy said, I can't say to him, Joe, what are you thinking of? I need to say, Joe, what is it like to be so confused? What has it been like for you in your life to be thinking one thought and then questioning yourself and then finding that words come out of your mouth and they come out the wrong way. What's that like for you? Because it must be so difficult to live with yourself. And how do you think it affects other people around you? And hopefully he might say, oh yeah, I've had quite a lot of trouble with other people over that. Because I question myself all the time. I think, oh yes, that's what I think. But then, I say something and I realize as I'm saying it, oh my goodness, what did I say then? No, I really meant this. And then I think, is that what I meant though? And now he's got a double whammy of it because he's got this Neptune Jupiter thing hitting the top of his chart, the mid heaven, which is public image. Well, it's bouncing around between the top and the bottom part. I'm trying to forget the technical details to tell you how this works. But anyway, Neptune and Jupiter, he doesn't know which way is up. He simply doesn't. I don't believe that anything he says comes from his mind. It's coming from somebody else's mind, a load of other people. And I'm saying that as an astrologer. So that's him. But he's connected with this because he's had a lot of fingers in pies in the Ukraine. And... Uh, I don't need to tell everybody, he gets called a lot of names and, and astrologically, all those names fit him. And yeah, I, I, I don't know how we get, got to where he is at all. Um, I don't understand it other than 
He's very good at telling people what they want to hear and telling people what other people think, if you see what I mean, because he doesn't know what he thinks himself. So that's him. And then we've got Putin, of course. And this is the funny thing that happened today, because all over the internet, we've got astrological charts for famous people. And Thomas wrote me a message and he said, oh, you know, um, do you know Astrodense? It's a kind of, a, what do they call it? It's a, it's a website. And people can just go on there and they can put horoscopes together. And I think this is a fascinating part of modern life and about this Neptune Jupiter thing that we're coping with at the moment, where none of us know what day of the week it is and what to think about anything. Because when I looked at Putin's chart on this AstroDense site, it wasn't the same as the chart that I'd drawn up, because I do it the old fashioned way. So it got me thinking, well, which is Putin? Who's Putin? Because I've got this one here and there's this other one and it's on, I looked up several other sites and I suddenly had this revelation about the world and the way it is now. Because we have all this astrology is becoming quite popular nowadays because people want a quick fix. They want to come to somebody like me who says, yes, that's going to happen tomorrow. And the following thing's going to happen the week after. And they go away and they think, oh, I'm more certain now. I'm not uncertain anymore. That's made me feel better. But how much better it is if you can just tap a few keys on your computer and up comes a chart. It's magic. And then everybody says, that's Vladimir Putin's chart. I've got a feeling that somebody made a little error in their calculations because when I went into my calculations I realized that the, the Vladimir Putin that everybody sees online is actually based on a London time GMT and he was born in St Petersburg he was born in St Petersburg at 9 30 in the morning so it's a little bit like um, what, um, I forget his name. Is it Tom, the man that was talking earlier on, the man in Australia? No, Ian. Ian, sorry. Ian said, oh, well, I haven't got time to go away and check this. But I thought after this meeting, I'm going to check. I'm going to write to my man that designed my computer program for doing horoscopes. I don't mind admitting I do it on a, on a computer because I trust him implicitly, because I'm gonna ask him, can you just check this for me with Vladimir? Because if he's right, then everybody's looking at the wrong Vladimir. Isn't that interesting? So the Vladimir that I see was bound to be a leader. It was his destiny, shall we say. And I looked and I thought, I don't understand this. What, why has he suddenly done this? And it was only when I started to study the history of Russia and what Vladimir Putin has tried to do and been stopped. Then I began to understand. But then I looked in his chart and in the chart that I first drew up, it has a Virgoan ascendant. And opposite that is this weird Neptune Jupiter thing. I'm in a drug den. I don't know what day of the week it is when get me out of here. And I think my feeling is about Vladimir Putin is that he is on a mission and he thinks that it's a holy war. He thinks he's going to clean things up because I don't know if anybody's ever heard any of his speeches, but his speeches are amazing. Yeah. And he does talk a lot of common sense. He's got Saturn in a very important part of his chart, which means that he's a very serious minded man and he thinks very deeply about things and he's very clear headed. And he thinks that Europe is corrupt. And he thinks that the young people are falling to bits and that they're given far too much leeway. And he thinks that we're a den of corruption basically. 
And he now, because he's got this transit going on, he thinks, right, this is my time. I'm going to go in there. And I'm going to stop all this ridiculousness, all this materialistic rubbish. And we're all going to get back to being sort of Christian again because he's very keen on Russian Orthodox Church. And of course, Kiev or Kiev, which whatever you want to call it, is you know, associated with the Russian Orthodox Church. So there's far more to Vladimir than the press and the media ever give him credit for. And I find that deeply, deeply sad because that's why we're in the state that we're in now. In fact, my voice is getting quaky as I say it because we rely on lazy media coverage and people can copy horoscopes, they can just cut and paste, and they can cut and paste, uh, you know, what's happening when it isn't actually happening, or it's a viewpoint. But all of this will eventually sort itself out by 2024, because in 2023, Neptune and Jupiter are moving apart from one another, and other things start to happen in the heavens. And Pluto will have gone into Aquarius. So governments will have fallen right, left and centre in the next two years. Macron is one of the people who's not going to be around. I don't think he'll be around. Uh, is it, Thomas, you can correct me. I think there's going to be an election uh, this year in sure. France. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, and Macron very quickly, I did his chart and I thought, oh dear, poor Macron. He's been so utterly miserable ever since he became the leader in France. But, um, Sheila, much as I love to hear about Macron because of time. Can yes. You that till the next one, please. Yes, of course. I, I'm, I'm a great. There's a lot to say. <laughs> I'm a great fan of Macron and um, I'd love to um, hear all about that next time. But. I think what we've what we've heard from Sheila, and thank you so much, is only a glimpse of how astrology might help analyze some of these complex leaders. And you know, I, I've always wanted to write a book called the, the Astrology of Peace, which would, in mediation, the kind of work that Priscilla and Shrey and others do, I think we should make it an option to analyze the two parties' charts in detail with someone like Sheila and then find out a language to help heal, bridge the gap, you know, because that's what astrology is. It's a sort of symbolic language in a Jungian sense, um, which, which can help shed light on the, both the individual psyche, but also the collective unconscious, the bigger movements of things. Um, on, can I, on can the, I just uh, add one thing that's a quote from the Bible? Okay. And it's from Luke. And it says, brother, let me take out the splinter that is in your eye. And when you cannot see the plank in your own, what a hypocrite. Take the plank out of your own eye first, and then you will see clearly enough to take the splinter that is in your brother's eye. No, no, thank you very much for that biblical quote. I, I know it very well. Um, I just want to just to respond very briefly before we move on to our next speaker, and I'm hoping that uh, maybe Rosalba can say something, um, is that, yes, I, I think in a sense what you've said is very interesting and useful, but it also to me shows the limitations of astrology as a philosopher, because, you know, if you can look at Putin's chart and say, well, it's fine that he's this way and that and ranting against liberalism and ranting against the West and invading other countries and assassinating people and using poisons to kill them and all the rest of the history. If we're going to start using astrology as a sort of justification for people's pathologies, I think we have to be very careful. I just want to just flag up something, that there is a religious dimension to this war. And if my friend from Kiev were on this call, she'd be jumping up and down and saying, look, hang on, stop bashing Ukraine, because they have a separate Orthodox patriarch now from the Moscovite one. They've separated off. There's a Ukrainian patriarch, and they're both equal in God's eyes under the patriarch in Istanbul. Now, the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow around Putin don't like that. 
they are on a religious crusade, but I'm afraid it's about a thousand years out of date. Oh, yes. Putin is trying to put the clock back to sort of medieval theocracy. Now that gave us Ivan the Terrible. He used to keep torture chambers in his in his cellars where he thought he was doing you a favor by torturing you to death because if you repented, you would go to heaven, whereas if you die and sin, you'll go to hell. So sorry, Mr. Putin, Europe doesn't want to go back to the like 11th century of Russian orthodoxy. I'm, I'm not saying I agree with him. I'm just saying yeah. that's what I see is happening I, to him. I just want to clarify that. He's kind of deluded and thinking, oh, I'm going to just clean everything up and, and I'm the good one. OK, well, I thought I heard you justify him. And no, I'm, no, no. I'm, but it's I'm, difficult in a few words because I could okay. have talked for three hours. So but also think, his, rant, his rant extends also to homophobia. He hates the West because... Oh, yes. Yes. Matters of sexuality. He wants to, he's on a holy crusade to destroy liberalism. And that's why he's aligning with people like Russia, uh, sorry, like China, which are also a totalitarian anti liberal state. So I think, you know, let's not, let's not buy all the propaganda that's coming out of um, Russia today or Fox News. We have to be a bit cleverer than that and, and find a sort of middle way. Um, but anyway, you've stimulated lots, and I hope you'll come back next time and do Macron's chart and Trudeau's, because as a Canadian, I'm interested in that. Um, Rosalba, can we, can we hear, what do you think the, um, the ecological imperative is here? Surely it's for peace. Surely we, we have to stop this war like today. Yes. We have to do what Mandy said and send the vibes of ceasefire, don't we? because it's our moral duty with nature. Can you tell us about that, Rosalba? Yes, um, I can say about uh, an initiative uh, that the uh, Eco Spirituality Foundation, my, my uh, association has taken um, in the direction of a contribution of peace called New Eco Spiritual Renaissance. Is, um, the new eco spiritual renaissance is a cultural movement and expression of opinion, is a non political with no party or professional affiliation. Is inspired, is a movement inspired by the philosophy of, of eco spirituality uh, proposed by Giancarlo Barbadoro. The concept of eco spirituality arises from the experience of natural people meaning those native population that have resisted assimilation into the religion and ideologies of majority society. They remain on every continent as cultural that have maintained that contact, their contact with Mother Earth, understood as a point of reference of, for individual personal spiritual growth. Eco-spirituality is, uh, is uh, a philosophy of nature, an experience of inner harmony extending to include everything around us with due respect of, uh, for environment, environment and all forms of life. This is uh, uh, what uh, we, we thought is uh, that uh, eco-spirituality can resolve all the problems of, uh, of the earth in this moment, because uh, is, uh, it, it's uh, the reflection of uh, an harmony, in, an inner harmony that uh, is taken by nature. This is, is what uh, we, we thought about this. In, in reality, I have, uh, I have already a statement <clears throat> referring on what is happening in this day. If you want, uh, I can read. Yeah, please do, yeah. <clears throat> this day, there is inevitable to talk about the event that and there are happening in Ukraine and the state around Black Sea. I would like to talk about a past in which around the Black Sea, there were Celtic tribes who live in peace, a federation of states. It was the first, uh, perhaps the first experience of European Union. As the tradition tell, the first settlement of this population was located in the area where the Black Sea now exists. According to myths, uh, this area represented the ancient cradle of humanity, an archaic hurt that had seen the splendor of the great uh, civilizations, 
civilization rise. Tradition report that uh, at the beginning of its history of Gelts, in the place of uh, current Black Sea, there was a large fresh water lake entirely surrounded by incredible fertile agricultural lands of Black Earth. The ancient civilization of the fertile basin of the Black Sea was a veritable Eden, Eden that had hosted humanity for thousands of years, a humanity made up of different eth ethnic groups who coexisted peacefully with each other. Unfortunately, the last gl glaciation caused an inevitable rise in the sea level of the planet. It is estimated that around 5000 BC, the Mediterranean Sea overflowed from the Bosphorus Strait and erupted into a vast depression of Black Sea. The overflow caused a really flood with the force of 200 Niagara Falls and the luge that submerged everything in the, and the ancient culture of millennia that lived there were forced to flee to settle in other surrounding territories. There is a find that can demonstrate that the Celts were not a single people, but a federation of ethnic, ethnic groups. The cauldron of Gunderstrup, this precious find preserved in the Danish National Museum on Copenhagen, is a large silver cup whose origin is in the region of the Lower Danube on the Black Sea. It's made up of 13 silver plaques attributed to as many Celtic clans joined together in a federation of nations. People who united in peace and a common identity. In this uh, difficult time when we are witnessing a fratricide war in the same territories, the contender should remember that their origins and learn from the ancient tradition based on peace and brotherhood. And this is what we all hope for. Thank you. Gosh, well, thank you, Rosalba. That was a brilliant little survey. Thank um, you. That part of the world is very sacred. Um, <laughs> and you're right, you know, the, the Celts, the Druids, were all the way down to the Danube. Yes. And archaeologists have found uh, Kurgans and burial places. Um, and it's ironic, we had Rollo Morfling on this call a minute ago. He's had to log off, but he's yes. the Archdruid of Stonehenge and part of the British Council of Druid Orders, which I'm their peace officer for. So, um, you know, it's a small world. And yes, the answer surely to these wars that are affecting Europe is to get back to what Rousseau called that, mm -hmm. that low level, non-hierarchical, sort of each community is responsible for its own um, laws. You know, Rousseau was a sort of wandering Druid intellectual who thought of this, this harmony of the golden age that once was, and can we please get back to it? Um, he didn't like the fall of man myth that we're all evil, like Augustine said, nor did Pelagius, the great Druid Christian from Britain. Mm -hmm. and, um, so you've raised, you know, huge, huge things. Um, I mean, it's ironic, isn't it? Ukraine and Moscow are both orthodox, but maybe if they were both a bit more Gnostic, a bit more philosophical, they wouldn't be quite so angry with each other. I don't know. That's just being naughty from a Druid perspective. Um, yes. um, now, who would like to go next? We've got about another half an hour. Helena, you've joined us from Monaco, and you're an expert in international diplomacy. Um, and have been doing a master's. Um, are you with us, Helena Lorentzen? Um, do say a few words. What, what's your take on the crisis? And, and uh, have you been listening so far to what we've been saying? <clears throat> you've read the yes, declaration, I... haven't you? And you've signed our statement. <clears throat> uh, yes, I did. Yeah, tell no, us. I, I was uh, really surprised because right now I'm doing an internship with the Foundation for post-conflict development as part of my uh, my master's degree and uh, I was following the whole situation before it became a war that was one of my assignment and you know we thought okay now they're going to take the weapons out and uh, and then suddenly Putin says okay I'm going to to uh, have this 
I'm keeping these areas, but uh, so then the international people could not get involved. And then suddenly he attacks and it was just like, hmm. what happened? You know, it, it's like, how could this happen? Right. Why couldn't this be stopped? Why couldn't we find a solution? Why couldn't people be sent in? Well, why can <laughs> you wrote your master's thesis on sending meditators into conflict zones? I mean, I mean, where are there meditators going into the Kremlin? Sounds like Putin could do with a couple in his place, and maybe Zelensky <laughs> as well. You know, I wrote to them both um, ten days before the attack. Um, but it but it doesn't seem to help, does it? I mean, does this show that diplomats need to factor in? Um, a new dimension, like, like, you know, a transpersonal dimension. Yeah, they should. Of course, they should learn to meditate or, or do things like that. But would they be willing to, you know? And w w what about sending in like one of the, you know, that those really high level meditators or gurus that do affect people positively when they're around? What if they had been around Putin when he took that decision? Would have would he be taken the decision he took? Well, probably not. But I thought you were trying to organize that. Helena is, um, I mean, we've got to get the UN, instead of just sending in troops, peacekeeping troops, you know, we've got to send in peacemaking meditators. As, as a group of philosophers, that would be what we want. Send in a group of peacemaking meditators to teach these political leaders to get in touch with their own inner peace. Like Mandy said on the start of this, I don't know if you heard Mandy Khan's talk. No, I, I came in late, sorry. Okay, so you can listen to it at the end, but that was the whole thrust of what Mandy said, our keynote speaker, is that we're not gonna get peace on the, um, you know, on the outer political planes until we all reach it in our consciousness. Um, so true, we have to change, you know, the world has to change, we have to develop. Right. You have to find that inner contact by meditation or ethics or morals or... Right, okay. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're on the same side anyway. And thanks for signing the declaration. If you haven't already, um, please do. It's, 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 a, it's a plea from the heart, really, uh, which Mandy also talked about. This can't be solved only at the level of mind in terms of pure intellect, which is quite divisive and thinks in polarities. We have to come from the heart, the place of unity. Um, can I ask Barty to join um, the conversation? Because Barty Jane I, I am, has been working on this. Um, what's your take on how your methods could help um, solve this conflict, Barty? If you had Zelensky and um, and Putin in a workshop of yours, what would you do with them? Yeah, hi all. Uh, so we all are hearing day to day in, day out about the war going in between the Russia and Ukraine. People are sad and confused and irritated about the situation over there. But it can be a bit complicated and it is a bit complicated to understand, but we can still do our part in making the issue clear and developing our right mindset about it. Basically, if uh, we go to the root cause of the war, then we can work on the peace better. I believe that communication consists of a value system that we are living. We are trying to live by, and then it outlines a language, a thinking, communication, skills, means of influence that support the way of living. What contributes to violence, if we ask? and what things can contribute human being to stay connected with our nature. Everyone has times when they fall out with others. You must have seen, can you think of an inc incident when you fell out with your friend or a member of your family or a time when you, your family fell out with another family in your street or your village, right? So just give it a thought. How did the trouble start? What happened next? Did it get worse before it get better? Was it sorted out? If so, then how? So actually the reason why group of people or countries fall out are much the same, the reason why we fall out with our friends only on a bigger scale. That is a, a greed or a, a the power. So I analyzed when we educate to contribute to the structure that 
we living in is the structure where people claim to be superiors and know what is right for others to impose they believe is right on others and what they are living requires certain way of thinking communicating and using power and i saw uh, that was the problem that created violence and creating uh, it is uh, creating violence in certain way of thinking certain language and certain way of using power so no matter the aggressor or the reason wars are the terrible manifestation of human kind and it leads to loss of life prosperity and development of new geographical issues the past is witness to human cruelties and casualties in areas incurs during the war so whether we agree with the views of russia or ukraine or any other country uh, arbitrating we must be striving to make the life of us and the people around us peaceful and we as youth are not directly impacted by the war however this doesn't mean that we are safe from the after effect of it like oil prices are uh, skyrocketing and stocks are impacted uh, impacted the worldwide uh, also the people they are facing difficulties and it's human cause to think uh, about our contribution that we can do and in current situation it is very much required that we spread awareness about the consequences of war uh, and uh, the benefits of peace to avoid a uh, future consequences of such situation uh, i believe truth is the key of peace satya is the core part of ahimsa when society loses its truth corruption violence and fear arises people prefer power and wealth based on lies or friendship ties based on truth and here is the role of spirituality if you are spiritual you will definitely follow the path of the truth so uh, i believe that peace and love education must be a part of education system so in uh, in coming situation we should work uh, on this thing that peace we should inculcate peace and love education as a part of the education curriculum holistic edu education through different techniques like we all are peace lover we all have our forte we all have our different kind of skill set so we can use that as skill set like music gaming activities psychological activities we have astrological activities which are based on science and spirituality so this should be a part of education system and i i would say to try to calm the hype or fear associated with the war and develop normalcy in your area and many more filled by the by your creativity like what we are doing with our namokar gym practices uh, of peace building pro programs we are working upon emotions and feeling stress and anger management violence in uh, media communication empathy uh, cooperation like tolerance conflict resolution keeping yourself safe and many such issues we can Uh, work upon uh, with our own innovative techniques like uh, we, are, we are using breath work meditation peace meditation um, which inculcate music mantra yog psychological practices so we all have such parts that we can use in our area and yes we can contribute uh, to stop such uh, activities of war uh because we are also though we are away from russia and ukraine but we are part of the society so everybody uh should pay their role uh in peace building in their own way and at last i would like to say that world peace yes world peace can be achieved when in each person the power of love replaces the love of power so and that's what yeah thank you thank you very much Barty for your eloquent words. And Barty um is our youth coordinator. So if you know any young people in your town or village that want to get involved with the work we're doing, um you know, the intellectual world forum. I mean, I used to teach philosophy at um uh in Carn just near where Sheila lives in Wiltshire. You know, children 12, 13, 14, 15, boys and girls love thinking. They love intellecting. They would you know 
it's not a preserve of adults. In fact, adults are, show little capacity for intellecting these days. I think the children are the hope. So thank you very much, Barty, for reminding thank us. Thank you. Of that. Thank you. Um, now we have a treat. We're coming to the end of our allotted time. Those of us that want to stay on later, fine. But um, we have a treat from our neurologist, our neuroscientist, Aaron Sikawa from India. Um, and this, this is sort of to end on a, well, it's a serious note, but also a slightly, hopefully you'll find it witty and, and somewhat refreshing. Um, Aaron, are you ready with the text? Can I explain? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, this is the text. Uh, as, as already we are amidst the, you know, the ongoing war in Ukraine uh, and with Russia. So, so there's nostalgic and very pessimistic note in the news coverings nowadays. So this text says, next a professor of mathematical neurology addressed us and outlined the way that the microtubules inside neurons operate in signal receiving dendrites and signal sending exons. And the number of signals sent and received per average day on earth for all humans having been calculated. A way was being devised to see what percentage of these impressions were either positive or good or negative or fearful or, or, or somewhere in between like loving and unifying. And whether the quantitative data from the microtubular impulses analysis could in some way be converted into ethical mathematical choice. So here I would like to add upon the, the, that there's a structural and functional unit neurons in the human brain and human brain where the mind resides. And these neurons have a microtubules. These are cytoskeletal proteins in network in the neurons, exons, and dendrites. And then there's a signal transduction goes on. So it could be excitatory or inhibitory in nature. So here, there's a, a, this is the beauty of mathematics, which is the you know, science of zero and numbers. So it it's converts that all the neurons of one person and then all the humans all over the globe, that what are the impressions of positive and negative each day? And this is being corroborated here. So next further, it, is, uh, it says what happens in the nervous system when people make decisions injurious to others or themselves as opposed to loving and positive. And they were conducting research in both hospitals and prisons on this matter, as well as among couples and family therapy. So here it is being uh, like, uh, explained the beauty that how the brains of each person and each uh, uh, person's, you know, uh, the brain has a uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurons or, or the, you know, the opposite ends of happiness and sadness and how, uh, this much I could understand in the perspective of my neurobiology knowledge, Professor Thomas. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Um, so this, let me just say, this this text is taken from a, a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called The Principles of Religious Mathematics in Latin. And um, I'm exploring this idea that we need to develop a religious mathematics, right? Um, to, and so this it's part of a meditation that we haven't got time to go into detail, um, reflecting on what mathematicians might be doing 100, 200 years from now, 300 years. You see, mathematics at the moment is helping the arms trade. It's helping the nuclear weapons that have been put on alert by Russia. Very sophisticated mathematicians around the world are working for the military industries. You know, I've, I've looked at this from a much bigger time perspective, and I've said maybe two, three hundred years from now, when people have all got into the peace mind that Mandy talks about, we can yet then use our mathematics for useful things, for spirituality, for, for peacemaking. So that's the point of the book that I wrote, which uh, I've sent, you know, it's uh, published a couple of years ago. And, um, but it's a mathematical puzzle because right now in, there's what 15 of us on this call we all have trillions of cells in our bodies billions of neurons that are all firing up and it's a sort of mathematical puzzle is what is how can you create happiness 
neurologically for everybody, you know. Um, it's just it's just a mathematical puzzle that um, I don't know, Aaron. If you can think about it and report back next next month, that would be good. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Now I got more ideas about this paragraph. Okay, I will uh, study this and let you know. Okay. Thank I'd you. like to invite Givork. We're coming up to the very end, but Givork's joining us from Ar Armenia, and her, his country has just been part of an unpleasant conflict over Artsakh. We issued a declaration about that. Um, how do you see this? This must be terrible for you, Givork. I mean, it's on your doorstep. Armenia is very close to Ukraine. Um, you were in Kiev not long ago. Tell us what the Armenian people are saying about this this war and what what can we do to stop it? Thank you, Thomas. Um, in Armenia, we uh, all uh, realize that uh, this war uh, is uh, uh, very uh, dangerous also for uh, uh, first of all, uh, for uh, the neighboring countries. And uh, uh, as far as uh, we uh, were Soviet <laughs> republics with Ukraine and Russia, uh, we know each other uh, much better and we understand, the, uh, understand each other uh, better. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't have uh, a, a special presentation, but uh, uh, I think that uh, the uh, situation, these uh, problems that we and uh, the whole mankind is facing, uh, these are uh, the results of our uh, godless life and uh, actions during the uh, last uh, centuries, uh, maybe we can say. It's very complicated uh, situation. Uh, uh, the thing is that all we have given uh, our, uh, the keys of our uh, uh, doors to uh, these people, Putin, uh, Biden, uh, Pashinyan, etc. We have given, we, uh, during the elections, we have given them uh, the right to make decisions and they do what they want. They, uh, uh, we can uh, here uh, present uh, very nice uh, th theories and very nice suggestions, but uh, they are not interested in this. I don't know, uh, uh, it's uh, very uh, um, critical, of course, but uh, uh, I, I would like Thomas, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 using this opportunity to apply uh, our colleagues uh, to make to make uh, every time uh, a small step, uh, a practical step. Uh, I have signed uh, the appeal uh, you prepared. Let's also sign the previous statement about Artsakh. Let's make, uh, uh, let's do something practically uh, to influence uh, these dictators, uh, dictatorial regimes. And let's uh, pray uh, much more for peace hmm. in Ukraine. And Sorry, it's all over the world. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you very much, Kivork. Thank you. Um, it reminds me of something. Um, I do a daily meditation and prayer 
ceremony here in, in the Peace Museum, with the European Peace Museum here in France. And Gavort came here a couple of years ago, and we had a conference. Uh, Rebecca was going to join us from Italy on this conference, but she's been teaching this afternoon, Gavort, but she sends her love to everyone. She's our, our Italian organizer. And today I got in meditation, I was musing on this, this tragedy. Um, I think Christian nationalism is part of the problem. Um, you know, it's the problem behind Brexit and the thinking of the Brexiteers, this sort of Britain first thing. And I think Putin is best summed up as a Christian nationalist. He believes Russia first, Russia's the best, the only Christians, you know. To me, this is antithetical to true Christianity. We're seeing two largely Christian countries, Russia and Ukraine, at each other's throats. And, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's a matter for shame. And the phrase that came to me in the meditation was Christian internationalism. The antidote to Christian nationalism has to be internationalism. And to me, I don't see how you can call yourself a Christian and be just a nationalist. You know, I love my country. I love my birth country, Canada. But I've traveled in 40 countries around the world. I'm, I'm an internationalist. The people that invented the European Union were Christian internationalists. Um, people like Monet and de Rougemont and the founders. That's what's at stake here. Um, you know, can we, can we allow a sort of Christian nationalism to come back up? Or should we grow out of that and go into, and I would go further than just a Christian internationalism. I would say we need a global internationalism for the oh. Jewish, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Muslim community, all the rest. So anyway, that's just a thought. Um, but he's right, do sign the declaration, both for um, Artsakh, but also for Ukraine. I'd like to hand back, we've got another few minutes. Um, I'd like to give the floor to- Hi, how are you doing? I'm sorry, I had to do a Zoom meeting and it went way over the time that I thought. So I'm just finishing the meet. I, I can listen to it while I'm doing the treatment, but it's an international meeting that I had to attend. Okay, so, yes, that's yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Um, now, Mandy, are you still with us? Because um, would you like to comment on, on the discussion? You started the meeting. Um, if you're still there, um, I'd love to invite you to finish the meeting and maybe make a few final um, comments. You've heard what people have said. Um, what do you make of the discussion in response to your opening thing? And have you got any final thoughts for us? My final thought, thought is a reflection on what Rosalba said. I completely agree that the First Nations people who, who know, already know how to walk in peace, have everything that we need um, in terms of understanding how to create communities that are based in healing. The knowledge that we need is here and it's living and it's in the living communities of people who still carry the tradition that, that has been thousands and thousands of years, not just in the making, but in the honing. So what we need is already here and there are teachers here that are can share that with us. So um, simply remembering the living library of wisdom that exists in these communities on the planet and simply foregrounding that wisdom would be an incredibly direct path from where we are to, to a, a harmonic way of being. And you tell us about your time at Standing Rock, Mandy, because you've spent time with the uh, American Indian First Nations peoples, their struggle for their water rights and so on. Tell us what that was like and what you learned there. So in, in 2016, um, water protectors were called to the Standing Rock Reservation here in, um, in, in the US and I was very grateful to be there. Um, and, you know, the, the 
there is nothing more powerful than healing prayer. And the prayer walks that I was lucky enough to participate in at night um, were, I truly believe that they had ripple effects, not just where we were in North America, but, but throughout the world. There were um, sometimes 500 of us um, making a, a, a midnight walk for, um, for the, the, the return of the peaceful sovereignty of the original, um, the, the, the original tribes of that area and the return of the remembrance of the holiness of the waters of this planet and the earth of this planet. So I was um, just seeing and feeling the, the power of collective prayer in that holy place uh, really, I think, helped me to understand how we can both affect great change where we are, but how, I mean, when we engage the power of prayer, we were talking a little bit earlier about the power of meditation, when we engage these things, we affect the collective consciousness and we collect, we affect the whole field. So um, it was beautiful to be able to, to feel that, experience that and learn firsthand how effective it is. Right, well, thank you very much, Mandy, for those closing thoughts. I'm bringing in the um, eco-spiritual aspect of um, indigenous cultures, which is, something dear to my heart as a Druid. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time with the Celtic, but also indigenous peoples all over the world. And the notion that the earth is sacred and therefore worth preserving is, I think, what we're affirming in this. And this is why we're against war. Or if I must correct my language uh, after Mandy's peace class, why we're, you know, why we're for peace, shall we say. Um, I just want to say in closing, thank you to everyone that's spoken and uh, from the heart. It's, um, you know, it's important we come together. We have these meetings every month um, for the World Intellectual Forum and my Peace Studies Institute. I think peace is, is so important that every university should have a peace studies department. Um, and I think that one of the books I've written is a dictionary of peace words. What is the word for peace in Hopi Indian or Sioux or the African language, Hausa, or in uh, you know the Central Asian languages? I've just been doing um, my Tarot of the Gods. I've just been working on the god Tengri. And I want to just finish by introducing you to Tengri, who was the Mongolian and Turkish, Hungarian and Bulgarian name for God. And this was the whole of Central Asia the Mongolian Empire was the biggest empire the world had ever seen. Genghis Khan worshipped Tengri. And so what is Tengri? Tengri is the blue sky of infinite space. Just think about that for a minute. So Tengri in my tarot card, it's like the blue sky of infinite space. And a lot of Russia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, they all have indigenous shamanic people who still worship Tengri. And when you worship Tengri, the infinite blue sky, you have humility because, you know, we're all just little tiny ants in comparison to the infinite blue sky. And um, so in my tarot card, of course, I've given the spin that Tengri is very upset at the war between Ukraine and Russia and, and wants them to stop because they're all his children. Um, so anyway, there's a, a closing thought. Look into Tengri. It's very, he's, a, he's a hell of a god, I tell you. And he could sort this problem out. Um, and what he is, is infinite space, infinite emptiness. And the Buddhist tantrics, who then became the leading religion in Mongolia, transformed Tengrism into Tantrism. And the words even come from the same root. Because in Tantra, it's the Shunya, the infinite space, that is the place of enlightenment. <clears throat> in Tengrism, it's the infinite space of the sky that is enlightenment but we take that in every time we breathe we're all made of emptiness and that's the insight that um mahayana buddhism brings form is emptiness we're made of emptiness you know so let's celebrate that enjoy 
one to another rather than killing each other, which is a very primitive thing to be doing. It's time we grew out of that. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to next month. Spread the word, sign the declaration, um, and uh, enlighten as many people as you can in the next month <laughs> to the importance of peace. And send your prayers to the people in Ukraine, to our dear friend, um, uh, Larissa Karachevtsva, who I met at a Jain conference on nonviolence. She teaches at the Institute of Philosophy in Kyiv and is a very profound expert in Levinas and, and uh, you know, European philosophy, Jewish philosophy. She's a semitologist and an expert in the Kabbalah. Um, so, you know, and, and Ukraine was one of the centers of the Baal Shem Tov and the whole Hasidic and Kabbalistic movement. So from a Kabbalistic perspective, war is a ridiculous jiggling of the tree of life. It's to use Mandy's lovely, you know, it's a peace tower. From a Kabbalistic perspective, it's going up and down the tree of life. And we mustn't jiggle it too much or it falls over. Every part of it, every leaf, every sephirot is sacred. And every, um, every floor in the peace tower, to use Mandy's metaphor. Okay, let's finish there. Bless it, let's thank so much. Thank you, Thomas, thank you. Thank, thank you to all, bless you to all. And, um, all dear friends, we'll see you next month, okay. See you next month. Um, Bye. Ciao. Blessings. Ciao. Ciao.